center aisles is kind of weird. But how am I supposed to give an invitation? Right? Well, I, see. I know. It's a, the back row Baptist you have to come all the way around or maybe you crawl under. So it's just kind of crazy. So what, what's the term? So it's back row Baptist. We also got like side row Baptist. Like you have people who just like need to be by the fringe. So anyway. Oh, oh I got all those mics mic I got to wear. Double mic. Well, you know, so many, I got so many complaints about where's my old backpack, and I, I, I'll be honest, I kind of missed it. I missed this backpack. It's like my, you have a new one. my security. You? I got a new one, and, and, and mainly it's for when I'm lugging all my backpacks around, like when I'm lugging all my books around, because those, ba those bags, I can put books like this at the bottom of it, like stack them up, like 10, carry like 10 books in this. But it was causing stress on this, as you can see, it's... Well, you know, you can throw it in the washroom. What? Whoa! Look how loud I have to. But then I, I just feel like it gets appreciated more, you know. By I, it gets noticed. You, you notice it. So. Yeah, yeah we might notice it. Okay. Oh man. Um, so yeah, 
This is it's my favorite backpack. It's so wonderful. Does everyone else? Does everybody else have a favorite backpack? No, you have a favorite backpack. What? Um, it doesn't have a name, but now that you think about it, I, I, maybe I can come up with one. Like, I remember where I was when I bought it. Like, I remember, I remember, I bought it in Berkeley, California. So at the North Face oh, Outlet, uh, I bought it in Berserkly. So um, maybe I could call because it's from California. I could call this backpack Orange Julius. Uh huh? Uh huh? Orange. So it's like Jul His name is Julius, and I call it Orange. Come on, that's a fun. That's a funny joke. Okay, I, I mean, I think it's quality. Schneiders, how you doing over there? They're, they're, they're on, that's called the on deck circle where they're sitting. So if they don't like what I'm saying, they can bolt out the door really quick. So like, yeah, well, I, I, I know all the escape routes, okay? So Albright here is the most committed, okay? <laughs> he's uh, exactly right. He's, he's, he's crowd surfing to get out of here, right? He's like, ah. <laughs> no, I can see him just like um, be, be frustrated at something I say and just stand up and walk directly at me, moving these chairs and leave. Like, yeah, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. So anyway. Oh, anything exciting happening that I need to know about? Yep, I saw your babies. Really? They were with, Ed, with, they were with their mom, and they oh, yeah. love them, but they don't, they don't like me. No. But that's what I train them well, so no. <laughs> so no. They don't have to like me. They, 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 exa them. Exactly right. No, no. That's, um, no, yeah, they, they, nobody slept well. Nobody slept good in our household the last couple of nights, so they're probably just sleep deprived. So I'll, I'll probably start speaking in tongues here in just a little bit. So <laughs> never know how this is gonna go. Um, and I'm hoping. So don't. I'm checking. Does anybody want or need to hear the Astro score? Don't tell me, but I'm looking. Like I'm hoping this room, Miss Vin, no Densler, Densler. Vincenzo, you can pull up Vincenzo. So one of my, we talked about this, my, one of my former students, um, so who now is, you work at Berean, right? Yes. Shirt and everything. So um, this is the room I was in when I discovered I had prophetic ability regarding baseball. Okay? Because you forget that game seven of the World Series, the year we won it, was on a Wednesday night. Okay? And you've never seen... I've never been more humbled in my life than after, after this game, after this class. So I had to teach. Right? That back then, it was class at 6, class at 7. And so um, I was teaching from 7 to 8. Game started at 7.20. And Facebook Live will show you the viewership by minute. And you can see when the game started. <laughs> it's like I have viewers, 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 first pitch. Like it just drops <laughs> off. I'm like, you couldn't just kept it open on your phone to boost my ego? Like, watch it on the TV. You don't have to just turn me. But they just are like, off, power off. It's humbling. But that's the night I realized, uh, though I'm, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, um, I do have occasional prophetic ability regarding baseball. Um, because I said, I made some joke about, I forget what it was, but it was about how just in the same way that, that David took five smooth stones to the Valley of Elah, so too the Astros will need five runs to defeat the Dodgers. And sure enough, they won at 5-3. So I was you right. Know, you know, what? I just don't want to talk about it right now. I, looked, I just looked at the score, so, so I don't want to talk about it. It makes me sad. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. There's Bible study and then there's Astros, right? Okay. What? Exactly. A dozen. He, David took a dozen stones into the... Now, this is a hard thing for me because when I first moved to Houston, Houston was still in the National League, right? Um, and my, my American League team was the Athletics, which is crazy because, um, because up until... Up until a couple of years ago, in fact, it's still probably to the, the case, that's the team I've seen the most live because um, I used to be a pastor at a church that was, that was in the East Bay and of, of San Francisco, and our church, the little town I was a pastor at, was three or four train stops down from the Oakland Coliseum. And the Oakland Coliseum was built 
to house the Raiders and the and the A's, and so it seats 90,000 people. And so there's always tickets. In fact, they give you, they want people to come. And so they, um, the, like season tickets are like, like, I think the church, people in my church had like the senior citizens discount, 60% off season tickets. And so people just give me tickets like crazy because their parent, because people's kids were like, no, do not give up those season tickets. Just keep getting them, keep getting them. Um, and so I've been to that game, that stadium more than anything. And have you ever seen Oakland Coliseum? Like the pictures of it. You ever been there? Been there. Okay. Really? What were you, were you just visiting in California or? Yeah, we got all the ballparks. Oh, see. Okay. Here's my first off. Uh, how many of you like going to baseball games? How many of you are those people? Baseball's so boring. <laughs> I see you. Dennis, you gonna put up with this? I know. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so anyway, the, the base, it has been statistically shown there is more action in a baseball game than a football game. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They timed how much people are standing around. Like, don't get me wrong, I like football. But football really does characterize, en encapsulate two, two things that are wrong with America, right? <laughs> Violence and committee meetings, right? Because <laughs> that's what it is. They just, hey, Hey, let's beat each other up, and then in between, not when we're not beating each other up, let's have meetings. Wouldn't that be great? That's a, no, this is terrible. This is a, it's a truly American sport. I'm like, I'm sure that if somebody in a, in a huddle at some point has gone, this could have been an email. Okay, <laughs> um, and that's that's the way I think it should should work. Um, anyway, so back to baseball stadiums. What is the best baseball stadium you've been to? Fenway. What? Fenway. Fenway. Yeah. So I've been to Fenway. So I I was raised a Braves fan. Okay, I was raised a Braves fan mainly because we lived off in the, uh, my dad was all on military bases and um, the only, only people, back before Fox, Fox Sports and things like that, the only baseball I could get on TV was either the Cubs on WGN or the Braves on TBS. And I was young enough to get mad at the Cubs because back then they were still playing only day baseball. And I'd come home from school and there'd be, I'd want to watch cartoons after school, and there'd be a stupid baseball game on. I like baseball, but I like G.I. Joe more and Transformers. And so I wanted to watch the cartoons. It's like, stupid Cubs, hate them. So I, I grew up watching the Braves, and I loved them. Um, and so I went, I, I, when interleague play first started, I was living in Philly, and a friend of mine got tickets to Fenway, Boston, uh, uh, play, watch the Braves. Very cool. So what else? A, a, a good stadium. Wrigley, okay, yes. I went there. I got to go to Wrigley, too. So Wrigley, it's so cool. Wrigley was built, was it 10 years before World War I? It was built, when it was built, the Ottoman Empire still existed. It's kind of crazy. There was a sultan. When the, when, the, when, the Cubs, when the Cubs built Wrigley Field, there was a sultan. That's kind of crazy, like, just like in Aladdin. Um, Anybody else? Best baseball stadium. Anyone ever been to Pac Bell? Or I guess it's what they call AT&T Park now, San Francisco. Yeah. That's a good one. I, I, I've been to that one a lot. That's, that's, that's the one um, you can get up in these big bay views and things like that. It's absolutely beautiful. Petco's pretty good in San Diego. I've heard Petco's good. The, the, the stadium that was built to keep in bonds, yes. um, it's just cavernous. I've heard it's absolutely, everyone who goes there thinks that's an absolutely beautiful stadium. Anybody else have a good Anyone been to the new Ranger Stadium yet? No, exactly. It's true. It's true. Exactly. The Rangers finally, I've seen pictures of it. The Rangers finally figured out what the Astros figured out in the 60s, which is you will never win baseball games and you never convince a pitcher to pitch in, for you because you have to pitch outside in July. No one wants to pitch outside in July in Arlington. And so, but now all the, the pictures of the new stadium, people have compared it to like a, one of those uh, turkey baster, um, like pans from, from, from Thanksgiving. But anyway, it's... What the bank? Uh, was it? What are they called? The oven. What? The oven. The, oven. the uh, bank one, not bank one ballpark. That's that's Arizona or Chase Field. But what well, ballpark at Arlington? I did. I, I the brick one. The brick one's beautiful. Yeah, I did make. Um, I've actually been to the older one too. When I was when I first started at Baylor, they were building the new one. And Welcome Week, we drove up and I got to see Nolan Ryan pitch. We sat in the outfield. So cool. Um, but I, the, the wisest decision I've ever made, the, I've never felt more proud of my own sort of planning abilities. There's one time 
um, all my folks, I think I mentioned, my whole family lives in Tyler now. And um, one time we're there. This was, I think, before kids. or Maybe we just had Bethany. I'm not sure. But we're, me and my wife are up there in Arlington, and I said, Mom, can, can you watch Bethany? I'm just, me and Tambor are going to go to Arlington and watch baseball game. Okay, so I go. I get online. I'm buying. I check Google Maps to figure out which way the stadium is facing. Arlington Stadium faced south. And so in the evenings, first baseline, golden, beautiful, in the shade. And the third baseline is just being murdered by the sun, right? And it's, it, I think that, that Arlington Stadium in July in the evenings was kind of like what they say about Venus. Like Venus doesn't rotate or whatever. And so one side always faces the sun and one side always faces away from the sun. So facing the sun, it's like 800 degrees. And on the other side of the sun, it's like negative 800. It's like the, the, the and so... I was, in, I was enjoying myself in the shade. It was so, such a beautiful evening. And I saw people just like sweating and whatever over on the other side. And it can't be that bad. I went to go get a drink out on the, out on the mezzanine. Um, and I, yeah, I thought I was going to melt. By the way, I think the only time I ever used the phrase mezzanine is when I tell you about baseball games, right? Has anyone ever used the term mezzanine in any other context besides going to a baseball game? Go out on the mezzanine. Theater. What? Theater. Uh, well, I, I can't afford places, the other places that have mezzanines, okay? So, so go to the theater, like the movie theater. So, um. Now that you're working for us, uh, <laughs> your chair, uh-huh. you should be able to afford all that stuff. There you go. That's what it is. Yeah, because that's why people get into the whole ministry thing is for the, <laughs> for the payola, right? <laughs> that's why I got it. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyway, so other baseball stadiums. You like What? I've never been to Camden Yard. It's Baltimore. It's weird. Camden Yard set the stage. It was one of the new, the new um, uh, retro stadiums. And if you look, if you draw a line on which one's the oldest, which one's the youngest, um, it's now one of the older ones. Yeah. So crazy. J- that's uh, Cleveland, isn't it? That's the old Cleveland. Coolest stadium. Okay, I love. I don't know if I love baseball stadiums because it's just kind of. I don't know, there's history and it's a little archaeology, it's a little bit of outdoor space. I don't like dome stadiums at all. I think we've talked about this, but like there's a cool stadium in Cleveland, and I'm so glad they figured out what it is. Um, there was a park in East Cleveland called, um, called League Park. It was called League Park, and there was a Little League baseball stadium in there, and there was, there was like a baseball diamond, there was a, there was a pool in the outfield, it's just a park. And people didn't realize, or they had forgotten that that had used to be a Major League Baseball stadium. And not just that, the, it had been the home of the Cleveland Spiders. Uh, Cy Young had pitched the first game off of it. Babe Ruth had hit his 500th home run in that park. The 1925 World Series and the 1940 Negro League World Series were played at that stadium. Imagine realizing that Rennie Park, right? That's what it was, just a, just a city park was like this baseball history kind of place. And sure enough, there was one building. The, the diamond was still on the same spot as the original Major League Field diamond. And the, there was an, the ticket house was still there. It was the shed where they store the pool noodles, but it was still there. It was so cool. I was like, that is, that is really cool. So anybody else, any other thought? What's up? What? Forbes. Is that named after you? Really? Oh, because you're, you're from Pittsburgh, right? Pittsburgh. OK. And you know, when I went to college, uh-huh. Really? So what is your connection to the founding of the Forbes people? Are you? No. no, no. <laughs> Darn. So I was interested. And what is Forbes? So the, um, now the Pittsburgh, when I lived in Philly, I used to, my, I lived in Philly. My, my folks at the time lived in misery. I mean, Missouri. And um, I used to drive from Philly to, um, to, to St. Louis in one day. And I remember I'd take the Pennsylvania Turnpike across and then cut south of Pittsburgh. And that, I remember I'd, Listen to talk radio the whole time, and when I got to Pittsburgh, that's when I realized, what's the, what's the Pittsburgh football team? No. According to them, it's the Stillers. The Stillers. I'm like, call in now for your chance to win Stillers tickets this weekend. I'm like, Ben Stiller and Jerry Stiller are going to be here? Like, I didn't realize, why is sports talk radio selling Ben? Why, is, why are Ben Stiller and his dad touring? And like, and then after a while, I realized the Steelers take on whoever this weekend. Oh, the Steelers! You're, you're saying it wrong. You talk funny up there. 
That's the thing. I got, I got, I got, I got attacked for when I lived up there for saying things like y'all and fixin'da. I didn't realize fixin'da wasn't national. How many of you don't say fixin'da? Oh, because you're, you're from one of the Yankees. Yeah. How many of you don't even know what fixin'da means? <laughs> fixin'da. It's like used to could. There's the, there are certain words that are just part of our, our use. Uh, yeah, used to could is plu perfect tense, right? You know what used to could is, right? Like, I can't now, but used to could. Before I have kids, man, I used to could four kids stay up till you know, two in the morning or whatever. So uh, now I get up at two in the morning. So um, Stillers. Oh, but what do they say in Philly? They don't say they make fun of y'all, but they say yuns, yins, use guys. Just terrible, right? Yeah, so y'all are Philly people, right? Pittsburgh. Yuns, yeah. Yuns. I think. Yeah. Yep. That's right, those Pittsburgh people. I went in Westerners, right? You're from the Midwest, aren't you? So, um, yeah, it's, it's weird. But that's why I think y'all is just so simple. We've talked about this, right? One person is you. Two to four people is y'all, and five or more is all y'all. All y'all want to, so it's just true. Um, so anyway, uh, back to baseball stadiums. So other baseball stadiums. There, there's a point to this. Very, what? Old or new? I wish I had gone, been able to go to the old Yankee Stadium. Um, I've never been to either one. I, 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 I'm not a, not a huge Yankees fan. Um, in fact, my two favorite teams are the Houston Astros and whoever's playing the New York Yankees, and so, um, <laughs> and so, which is great. How about this for cool? Okay, um, there's an interesting phenomenon about American history that most people don't realize, that uh, the interstate highway system combined with, combined with penicillin uh, changed the fabric of America in some pretty interesting ways. First off, penicillin. Before penicillin, how did you get well? You didn't take antibiotics. You would go to these springs, right? Like west of, west, of, um, west of Dallas, there's mineral wells, right? The city of mineral wells. There are million-dollar hotels built in the 20s that are empty. They're, they're nothing. They're built on top of these because back, back in the day, you would go to these resort spas to get healing. Um, and with penicillin, it kind of went away. You don't need those anymore. Um, but two... Uh, interstate highway systems bypass a lot of these older towns. Anyone ever been, may, probably maybe going from here to Waco, Texas, anyone ever been through Marlin, Texas? Yeah. Marlin, Texas. Speed Do, crap. What? Speed crap. There you go. And now, and it's the home of um, Whoops Boomerang Barbecue. Okay, just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> whoops Boomerang Barbecue. But no, how many of you realize that one of Hilton's first hotels is in Marlin? Uh-huh, one of his first hotels. Two, the 1927 Yankees, Murderer's Row, right? The Gehrig and all those people, um, did spring training in Marlin Springs. It used to be called Marlin Springs. Why have you never heard of it? Why is that hotel not there anymore? It was a booming town until penicillin and the interstate highway system, right? Bypassed them both, and now it's just a town with a pretty good barbecue joint. So, welcome, welcome to American history. Um, 101. Uh, other, so the reason I say this is because the Oakland Coliseum, okay, is, is a universally faulted ballpark because it's ugly and it's old and it doesn't have all the modern amenities. But the truth is, the truth is it's the last of, and I would submit to you, the best of those multi-purpose stadiums that got built in the 60s and 70s, like, like the old Three Rivers, um, the old Bush Stadium, things like that, those multi-purpose stadiums. Um, and it's like the, I think it's the third oldest ballpark after Wrigley and Fenway. It's the third oldest ballpark in, or maybe maybe Dodger Stadium, My, was Bobby built before them. That's a good ballpark too. Um, but the only the only problem is if that hulking monstrosity in outfield, which is Mount Davis, which is what they built in the '80s to lure the Raiders back from LA, if that got bulldozed, you could sit in in the shade and look at the Berkeley Hills. It's a great place to watch a ball game. There's my endorsement. So, so, so years from now, when someone says, when they haven't torn down, the, if, it, if it can survive 10 or 15 more years, which it looks like it will, because they can't afford to build a new stadium in Oakland, it'll be another Fenway. Why did, why did all the other brick and, brick and steel um, 
stadiums get torn down besides Wrigley and Fenway? Why did Scheib Park in Philly? Why did, uh, why did uh, Ebbets Field in Brooklyn? Why did that, why'd those, why'd those all get torn down? Because they were old. They were not technologically new. They didn't have all the amenities that people wanted. And the Red Sox and the Cubs were the cheapest ones. <laughs> and so they were cheap, and they, they waited the longest, and now they have a retro park. So welcome to the part of the story called You Had to Ask, right? And I, I can stretch out anything. Any questions or comments about this? What's up? What? Hmm. That's the really that that's his real interest, right? <laughs> Gravedigger, Bigfoot. Are you a Gravedigger guy or Bigfoot? Which is it? Which 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 monster truck? Grave. I knew I knew you're a Gravedigger guy. Okay, I can see it in your eyes. So, um, okay, I've been. I haven't even went to the Astrodome. See Astros play. So I I didn't see Nolan Ryan play there. I remember that was the first. What? Three days ago. I went, I went to go see uh, Astros play the Cubs when I was like eight or nine. Um, I was playing living in Santo. Our Little League team went to, went to a game. Mike Scott was pitching for the Astros. I remember I was playing second base, and I got to do a little on-field on training thing with Ryan Sandberg, who was the second baseman for the Cubs. Um, and, and that was the time when I realized I did what every kid does, which is we all wore our uniforms to the game, and I, I remember I was putting on my cleats, and my mom was like, Steve, don't wear your cleats. Wear, just wear your shoes. You can wear your uniform, but you just wear your cleats. I'm like, but it was like this look on my face, like, what if they need me? <laughs> like, what if I got to be ready to go? I can't just have my uniform on. I got to be, I got to be ready to go with my cleats, too. And how old were you then? So I was like nine, yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, they did. They needed me. So, all right. Um, other comments or questions about baseball? So what's up? I have a pretty cool baseball story. Okay. Oh wow. Oh, wow. Yes. You know they're both named George, right? You know that. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. You should have just gotten mad. He's like, no, baseball or nothing, and slam the phone down, right? <laughs> that would have been awesome. So, yeah. No. So, anyway. Uh, my, so, do y'all remember when, okay, so sports, the, the sort of the comedic style sports news really got started with CNN, headline sports. Remember that? And the play of the day? Like, it was like, you know, the, Remember this? Does it sound like crazy? Okay, I, maybe I was living overseas on military bases, and that was a big deal. A CNN Sports Play of the Day. It's where a lot of the sort of the comedic take to sports radio, sports talk uh, came from. Well, um, my dad appear, was a part of the CNN Play of the Day one year. When, so when we lived in Japan, my, one of my dad's jobs that he had there, he was a protocol officer. And one of, one of his jobs was to plan schedules for dignitaries that came to visit the Far East. And um, people don't understand that like that's his job, but he still has to be there for normal hours. But they don't want to disrupt the normal routines. They always come in after hours. So my dad would work during the day. They'd have to be up 
be up for like two in the morning when, when, a, when a plane of senators would come by. Well, one, one day, Dan Quayle, the vice president, came through Tokyo and he lands at our base, Air Force Two lands, and he decides he wants to play a pickup game of basketball in the middle of the night. Right? Can you get together? And so it's my dad's job to kind of cater that I got to get a, a pickup game for, for these dignitaries. So, and so sure enough, it's Secret Service agents and whatever. And the play, of the, the play of the day, the CNN Sports play of the day, was Dan Quayle hitting a jump shot over my dad. Okay, he's like, uh huh. And so, yeah, I'm like, Dad, come on, we got to get in his face with that. You can't do no easy, jump, no easy jumpers. So, I was hoping, um, you know, my dad. My dad did te teach me the, um, the trifecta of, uh, of appropriate basketball play, right? You have to be able to, um, in the same, same way that pastors, you have to always be ready to preach, pray, or take an offering. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the basketball I was taught was, was you always be ready to make a free throw, right? Make a free throw, uh, hit a jump shot, take a charge, right? My dad could take a charge like nobody. Right, we he'd he'd play he'd play basketball on his on his on his um, hour lunch break, and he'd come home like brew. One time he was like getting ready, he had a, he was like sore. You tell he was sore, and and he had a, like a bruise in his chest. Right, I'm like, what happened? Oh, some, and he was bragging. I was like, ah, some guy tried to do a layup over me, and I took the charge, and we got the ball back. <laughs> And he crushed your sternum, right? This is a lunch game. Give up the two, right? Like this is not, <laughs> it's not the Olympic trials. This is not that big a deal. So, all right. Um, let's open up in prayer and then we'll, we'll dive into our study. So. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. I thank you for the opportunity to be with, be together. I thank you for um, all the technology that allows people who are unable to be present uh, for whatever reason uh, to, to to feel close to us, Father. Help the people who can't be here know that we miss them and love them. Um, in this weird and complicated time, I pray that you would grant us all grace, uh, that we would uh, help give other people what they need to feel comfortable. Father, as we open your word, I pray we'd open our hearts to speak to us today. Tell us what we need to hear. Uh, help us leave transformed because we opened your word and submitted to it tonight. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're doing 1 Corinthians. And to be honest, tonight's lesson, I almost, I almost skipped. I almost skipped this chapter or almost tried to combine it with another chapter because the, uh, the title of our study, title, a special time in a young man's life when he, so, so um, uh, the uh, voice starts to change. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, the title of our study is, is uh, One Spirit, One Body, One Lord. And the idea is, Corinth, Corinth was, was experiencing what a lot of churches and a lot of cultures experience. It had culture shock, and so the, 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 the fault lines of culture were beginning to stratify it, right? They, they had Jewish churches and Greek churches, rich churches and poor churches. They probably had churches that were breaking down by the philosophical school they ascribed to. That's a Platonic church, that's a Aristotelian church, that's a Stoic church, that's an Epicurean church. There are all these people, there's fragmenting. And Paul writes this letter going, stop, you, you're, you were called in one spirit. You are part of one body. You serve one Lord, and you need to get on the same page. Start defining yourself by what matters most. Um, and I think about how important that is for us because we live in a society. I'm not saying that, that all those other things don't matter, but they dwarf in comparison to um, this central idea of following, uh, following Jesus. And it just shows how, sometimes how far afield we are uh, when we find it easier to identify ourselves culturally by the state we come from or the activities we enjoy or the political party we ascribe to. Not that those don't matter. Our political parties, I mean, they, we have the right and the responsibility to be involved in the political process, but for some reason, it, it defines us in a deeper, more transformative way sometimes than, uh, than, our, than our identity in Christ. Tell people, you know, my father served in the military. My, um, my family's lived here for, fought in a lot of wars. I think America might be one of, one of the freest and best nations ever to exist on the face of the planet. But it's not the hope of the gospel. Nations rise and nations fall. And you are sitting in the only thing that Jesus promises the gates of hell will not prevail against. Right? And so learning that, reminding ourselves of that, and seeking common ground that way, 
is the most important thing. And that's what Paul's trying to do. Those divides that were, right now you go, who cares if they're Epicurean or Stoic? Those divides were as strong and as deep as the divides that separate American Christians or Americans in general. Think right now about all of the arguments you are ready to have. Maybe you don't have because it's not worth your time. All the arguments you are ready to have right now or want to have inside your own head because you could, about whether, about your a person's approach to the coronavirus or the person's approach to the, com, the, the most recent election, the person's approach to all of those things that, 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 the, that the news and the media just keep us inflamed about. Well, guess what? Stoicism and Epicureanism, all, those are just as real. And they, and they were hating each other because of it. And Paul writes these letters going, stop. We looked last week about, um, at, uh, at how, you know, who are you following? What is your foundation? What are you building on? And who are you trying to be? And start identifying yourself primarily as a follower of Jesus Christ. And let that seep into other things. Uh, it's weird. We define ourselves most by our citizenship in this world. And for some reason, that politics creeps into the church. Right? You can spot that's a liberal church, that's a conservative church, that's a Republican church, that's a Democratic church. Um, because, our poli- because that's our primary identity, it flows into everything else. Paul is saying, look, start with, I'm not saying those things don't matter. Start with Jesus. Start with figuring out who you are in Him and figure out how that is supposed to change every other aspect of your life. Um, you know, for some reason we have so narrowly defined, I think one of the reasons why it's happened with the politics thing is because we have so narrowly defined uh, what Jesus is the answer to, right? Most people think Jesus is the answer to what happens to you when you die, and he is. But, that's, but most people go, fine, if I accept Jesus into my heart, I don't have to go, I don't have to, go to hell when I die. That's, that's, we, I don't have to go to the bad place. I get to go to Six Flags Over Heaven, right? It's, we, we, sell, uh, we, make, we paint it like, ask, think about every gospel presentation you've heard at a, at a bad retreat, like, let me describe hell to you. Doesn't that sound terrible? You don't want to go there, right? Sounds like New Jersey. So, no, it does not. New Jersey's the Garden State. So, you know, I heard, heard a thing that said that um, New Jersey has more toxic waste dumps than anywhere in the country, and that New York has, has more lawyers per capita than anywhere in the world. And you know why? New Jersey got first pick. So, uh, get it? See, because they get them. Anyway, so. That's a lawyer joke, so. Um. <laughs> but, but, and so, um, to realize that, yes, Jesus is the answer, and then to spend your life trying to figure out what, what are the questions that Jesus is the answer to, that's the, that's the gospel. See, the, the Pharisees' gospel was hard, um, was, was hard to say. It was 900 rules, but it was kind of easy to do. You just had to check a, lo- check a box. Give somebody a list and just go down the list. Oh, I got to do that. I can't do that. It's rule checking. Jesus walks up and goes, hey, um, here's my gospel. It's easy to say. It's hard to do. I can say it in two lines. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor for the same reason you love yourself. And now spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what, it, what that looks like. And it's crazy. It's crazy that um, you ask somebody just that one phrase. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Most of us never talk about it. You've probably never even heard a study. Why do you love yourself? You don't love yourself because you're a good person. You know how bad you are. You love yourself because you're you. You love yourself because you're looking from the inside of your eyeballs out into the world because you just happen to be you. Well, love the other person for the same reason, just because they're them. They're the unique. They're the only one of them, too. Um, and it's weird how we find reasons to break that rule to ascribe, to attack a person for some other aspect of their identity. And so Paul spends a lot of time at the beginning hammering this down. No, no, what is your foundation? No, no, who is your identity? No, no, what are you following? No, no, who do you see yourself as belonging to? That's where we ended last, last year, uh, last week. Um, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. And you ask yourself, how do we say the phrase, who do you belong to? And most of us think about what team, um, what team do you belong to? I remember I, I was bewildered when I moved out to California that there are people who treat um, Dodgers versus Giants, as if it's a religion, right? It's their own little identity. There's violence committed against other people. I want like one time after a, after a Giants win, somebody was attacked in the parking lot. You know, I'll show you. Like, we did nothing but eat popcorn, right? To to cause the the Dodgers or the Giants to win or lose, we did nothing. Okay, I have nothing, no vet, but so we wrap our identity up in it. 
Who do you belong to? I belong to the Dodgers. Who do I belong to? I belong to what a political party? No, you belong to Jesus. And what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, like I said, it's a drumbeat that on the one hand, I get, it gets kind of kind of you know, monotonous. Okay, move on. What, let's get to the meat. Let's, let's, let's chew on some things. Let's argue about some stuff. Let's learn. But he, he spends one more chapter pounding this drum. And the reason why I felt it was appropriate for us to camp out here one more time was because of this one verse that I think is foundational to, to understanding, um, one, this, this book, and two, um, how we re- reorient our lives around following Jesus. And that's the verse itself, we'll come back, we'll look at it in the flow, but the verse is, is 1 Corinthians 4, 7. It's a verse I come, I come back to a lot, and it's a verse that, that you have to kind of internalize, and it's kind of the point. It's almost like, unless you get this point, nothing else is going to make sense. For who regards you, who regards yourself as superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you didn't, know, if you didn't receive it? Basically, Paul says, who do you think you are? Right? Who, 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 why do you think you're such hot stuff? What do you have anywhere about yourself that you didn't receive? Oh, I worked hard. I studied hard. I'm a self. We, this, this is a verse that's so true of America so many times because we live in a, in a world where we ascribe to be self-made people. And the truth is, um, there is nothing that you have that you created out of nothing. There's a, a, a humorous story one time told about a bunch of scientists who, who came up to God and said, Hey, God, we don't need you anymore. We figured out how to make people. We know how to do it, and so we don't need you to do it anymore. And, and God's like, okay, show me. Um, and he goes, fine. And so the scientist comes up, and he, he, grabs, he grabs some dirt, and he starts saying, and God goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You get your own dirt. You know? It's, <laughs> I made the dirt too, right? Like, um, the truth is God, God is the only one who creates out of nothing. We, we are only ever in a place of stewardship, okay? God gives us stuff, and we do stuff with it. And Paul is saying, look, there are a lot of smart people, some very rich people, very successful people. Um, and Paul is saying, what would you do to get born in that family you're born in? What would you do to get born in that country you're born in? What would you do to, get, to be able to be born um, in the time and the place? Like, there's a game you always play in, in college, right? If you could live in any time or place in the world, where would you live? And the answer is now, right? You live now because you like flush toilets and air conditioning and vaccinations and antibiotics and Dr. Pepper and all. I mean, yes, all of those things are glorious. Um, but ultimately, I didn't pick it. And sometimes, on the other hand, we live in a society right now where people look at other people who are successful for things they didn't pick, and they feel like uh, they are not successful for reasons that they can't control, and now we live in a society that's now fighting about it. And we have all these bad names that we had label um, different positions, and, and Paul doesn't say, I'm not trying to fault you for being successful. I'm not trying to fault you for being smart. I'm not trying to fault you for being in Corinth and being born into a rich family or whatever. I'm trying to get you to see that everything you have, you have received. And if you've done anything with it, realize that you didn't start out with zero. And how is that supposed to change how you see things? And, it's, and, and it makes us realize that everything we are is supposed to be focused on stewardship. And that's kind of, that's kind of what we're looking at tonight. That's what this, this chapter is about. He's talking about his, uh, himself by saying um, the background noise of this chapter is evidently some leaders in the various sects have been saying, I'm a better leader than Paul. Look how smart I am. Look at these fancy robes. Look at this, um, look at this nice car that I drive. Look at this big house. I'm clearly blessed by God. You should follow me. It's sort of the religious equivalent of, of why lawyers drive nice cars, right? Because if a lawyer drove up in a, in a you know, crappy Honda Civic or whatever, falling apart, you would go, this guy doesn't make any money. He's not very good, right? But when he pulls up in a, in a Bentley, you think, oh, he's very successful. And you're like, no, he's spending your money on that, right? Um, and it falls into the church, right? That's the whole myth of the prosperity gospel, these, these preachers who think that um, you know, having, having wealthy, uh, wealthy symbols are, are what are um, 
show that they're blessed by God. So Paul writes this chapter, and and he's trying to say, this is why I know I'm a servant of God. Look at verse 1. Let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Okay, he says, this, I don't want you to see me as the successful leader of a specific school. I don't want you to see me as the pastor of the church. I want you to see me, my identity is first and foremost as a servant of Christ and as a steward of the mystery. I've been entrusted with something. Um, and what you, you are given something and how you take care of it is the point. Jesus tells parables this way, right? He, everybody gets entrusted with different amounts of talents. And it's not... It's not whether you made as much as that other guy, it's what you did with what you were given. Um, and so he goes on, he goes, um, stop, treat, stop treating anything you have as belonging to you, realize it belongs to someone else, and let that change how you see your job and your responsibility and your relationships and your ministry. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will uh, will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each uh, each man's praise will come to him from God. So he says, first, the first key to stewardship is to realize your goal is not success, it's to be found trustworthy. To be found trustworthy. He who is faithful in little can be trusted with much. You be given something, and if I can trust you with this, then I can trust you with more. Um, You ever ever watch that TV show 24? Not on the air anymore. Um, I couldn't handle the anxiety, right? Every every single hour, things don't fit neatly into an hour, and then anyone, have never, never even heard of the show? The episode, the season was like 24, one, each, each season was one day. Each episode was 24 hours. And I just love the fact that it was like, uh, basically our beat meant, meant to, like we can get across town in one and a half episodes. And, um, but one thing that I loved in every single season, there was a moment when Jack Bauer, who's the, the key, the key uh, hero, is embedded in this terrorist cell. And he's following people back to their hidden lair. And um, on the way, they're going to test out their doomsday device on this small group of like this, this church picnic or this mall. And his handlers say, you got to let them do it. you got to let them kill 100 people or 1,000 people because if you don't follow them back to their lair, you're not going to find the nuclear bomb and a million people are going to die. And so J- the whole episode revolves around Jack Bauer following him around and being torn about, do I stop him? Do I stop him? Do I stop him? And people tell him not to. And then finally he does. And what's kind of cool, there's like a weird sort of Christian ethic to it because uh, he's told he has to let the little evil happen in order to prevent the big evil. And that's actually a lie that all of us get told by Satan all the time. We get told to allow sin in our life um, because it's a small sin that some greater good will come of because of it. And he's like, just let this little thing happen and some great thing will happen because of it. But guess what? Jack Bauer... Um, Jack Bauer saves the church picnic. He saves them all, and then he also saves the world. And I think there's a biblical principle involved there. You, you don't get to save the world until you, until you save the church picnic. You, you save 10 people before you can save the big picture. Big picture. Um, he says, uh, the goal of a steward is not to be successful. The goal of a steward is to be found trustworthy with what you've been entrusted with, to realize what you have doesn't belong to you. It was given to you as a blessing, as a blessing, but the first question you should ask is, how does the person who gave it to me want me to use it? And and so many times we don't do this. We don't do this with our money. We don't do this with our skills. We don't do this with... And what I don't think this means, I don't think this means you're not supposed to enjoy. Just take the issue of money. This doesn't mean you are not supposed to enjoy the blessings of whatever vocation, whatever fin- whatever paycheck you get or whatever financial blessing you have in your life. I think God gives, you, gives stuff to you because he wants to bless you. But one of the blessings he wants you to have is he wants you to have the joy of being the conduit of his blessing to other people. Paul's going to say this at the end of, 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 of 1 Corinthians where he goes, he goes, God allows some people to have more and some people to have less. And the people, he has, people who have less... 
He gave them that opportunity to, see, to have the joy of learning cheerful dependence upon Him. And the people He gave more, He did that for the purpose of, so that they would have the joy of being the conduit of God's blessing to other people. That God gives to you because He wants to give through you, right? That, that you are not a cul-de-sac of God's blessing. You're a conduit. And he, God, whatever you have, your intelligence, your skills, your opportunities, your wealth, your whatever, it is, it is designed as a blessing to you and then as an ever-expanding epicenter from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then the ends of the earth, right? To your family, to the people around you. And we should be looking to say, why do I have this? Who else needs this besides me? It's what I do with my kids' clothes, right? Where my kid... That, that, that all those boys, they just, he, he's grown real fast. I have all these clothes. And my first thought is, I have these clothes that I don't need. Who needs them? That's a steward. Every aspect of who needs this thing. One of the things I love consistently about Kings and I keep coming back to, and I, I, I can't say enough, is the, is the way in which this gets demonstrated to me on a daily basis. Paul's going to say later in, in chapter 12, that um, he says that about each one of us has been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, that we're all part of the same body. He's going to say in Ephesians that we're held together by what every joint supplies, that when all of us are doing this together, something new and amazing gets formed. And that's what the church is. It's a body where we're going, here's my contribution. I don't know what it is, but here, here it is. And make something of it. We're all doing our five loaves and two fishes, and God's feeding the whole multitude because of it. That's the cool thing. It's not to say, I don't have enough for this whole group to say, but here's my contribution to this whole. And that's what I've seen in this church. Everybody does um, what they're good at, and in the process, a whole lot of people get blessed. Right? And, and one of the ways in which people feel insignificant is when they think their contribution doesn't matter. Or when they're serving in areas outside of their giftedness. Some people... Um, some people don't realize it feels insignificant to them, but they are encouragers. And they just walk them down these halls and hug people and speak words of kindnesses and send emails to people and say, um, and, and are able to speak life into people in ways that they need to hear. Other people don't teach, but they go find people. And like I see people praying in the halls with each other, um, giving what you have and seeing what God wants to do in, 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 them, in all of us because of it. Find trustworthy. But also, Paul says in this passage, not, the goal of a steward is not just to be found trustworthy, but it's to focus on the right source of approval. Okay? Notice he goes, he goes, I don't need your approval, Corinth. I'm not looking to please you. And he's not saying it as some sort of arrogant person who goes, I, my conscience is clear. He goes, because I'm not, I'm not even concerned about my approval. Um, he's saying the only person I care about, the only, per, only approval I want is God's approval. He is focused on pleasing the thing or the person that he most needs to please. This is the, def the biblical definition of what it means to fear something. You've heard me talk about before, and it's true. Uh, when the Bible talks about fearing God, it doesn't mean to be afraid of God. You cower, you cower in terror and run from that which you are afraid of. Fear is to have a healthy respect for the power of something and a desire to please that thing. So normally, it's kind of like um, I do it with waterfalls, right? Anytime we were hiking and I see a waterfall, I want to get as close as I possibly can to it. And my wife is like, do it, and you're going to fall over. I'm like, no, I have a healthy respect for the power of these things. I'm not going to get, but I, I'm drawn to it. Um, people with fast cars do the same thing. You can be reckless with it, or you can be, have a healthy respect for it. Um, but also, you can analyze. So analyze, what are you afraid of? What do you, what do you, or what do you fear? What are you focused on? What is the thing that you are drawn to consistently over and over again? When you are tired, when you are sad, when you are frustrated, when you're angry, when you, when you feel empty, where do you go to get full? Right? That's what are you drawn to? You think it has power and you're drawn to it. Two, what are you most afraid of disappointing and most focused on pleasing? Could be your boss, could be your career, could be your... There's a thousand different things, but who has the right to command your primary obedience no matter what? Like, there are people who can ask me to go do stuff, and I'm like, yes, that's great, but I, I have plans with my family, right? My family comes first, always. That's the thing above, so whatever plans I make with you, if I have pre-existing plans with these people, yours get trumped because I, um, this is my focus. Um, you have something. And in Corinth, it was evidently 
people's ethnicity, my, my loyalty to my ethnicity, my loyalty to my language, my loyalty to my philosophical school. That's the thing that has the right to tell me what to do. I, I point this out, and I say this not to condemn because we've all done it, and, it, and, and but it highlights an issue. I can spot when the Texans have a noon game, right? Because this church is empty at 11. Like it was more when, energy, energy, when, when people were going to games, right? I'll go to church unless I have something better to do. Dallas Willard said, a disciple is somebody who systematically and progressively rearranges their life around following Jesus. A non-disciple has something better to do. You know, I'll, 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 I'll give, I'll serve, I'll attend, I'll worship, I'll study when I got the extra time, when I, when I, when I have a little bit of the overflow. What is the thing you always make time for? What is the thing you always dedicate yourself to? What is the thing you sacrifice for? That's the thing you want most of all. That is the thing you're drawn to most of all. That is the thing you're focused on. That is the thing you fear. So he goes, look, I don't, I don't, I don't need your approval. He says, I don't even need my approval. My conscience is clear, but my focus is on God. Um, and then there's this weird passage, verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that none of you will become arrogant in behalf of one, of, of one against the other, for who regards yourself as more superior. Does anyone have something else in verse 6 for, um, so that you may learn not to exceed what is written? Anybody have anything else written in your Bible? Something along those lines? Don't, don't go beyond what's written. Exceed. Anybody else have? It's a weird phrase, and, and people have wondered what this actually means. Seven, like totally different. Don't go. Don't do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up. Yep. Mmm, puffed. Like, any other power. like a puffy taco. San Antonio. Um, what is this? What is he talking about? Here is what I think this means. People are, were using their traditions and their philosophies and their worldviews to interpret Scripture. And so they were going, well, Jesus can't mean that because everybody knows, as Plato said, like one of the biggest things that people don't realize that most, a lot of American Christians are vaguely platonic in their worldview. Um, the, the platonic view of the world was physical world bad, spiritual world good. And one day, God is going to destroy the physical world, and our spirits are going to go be in the spiritual world forever with Jesus. What's the hope of Christianity? If you ask most American Christians, they will say, the hope of Christianity is to go to be with Jesus when you die. That is true, but it is not the whole story. You know, 1 Thessalonians 4, if we believe Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that when he returns, he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, and the dead in Christ will rise. That yes, when you die, your spirit will go be with Jesus, but that's not the end game. The end game is resurrection. God made everything in this world, and it is good. What was going on in Corinth was people had their philosophies about what the world was, and they were reading, and they were using that to interpret Scripture rather than using Scripture to interpret them. He goes, don't go beyond what's written. Don't say, that, that can't possibly be happening, because as Plato said, you know, we do the same thing. We allow our traditions to dictate how we read Scripture, rather than shaping our traditions to conform to Scripture. It's one of the big tensions um, in, in Catholic Christianity, is which is the higher, higher uh, rank, Scripture or tradition? And Catholic tradition exalts tradition over Scripture because it says the tradition, the cho church tradition chose Scripture, and so church, um, that's higher. You know, Methodism has the so-called Wesleyan quadrilateral where it has... Um, Scripture, tradition, experience, and reason all kind of support the same thing. We are kind of sort of anti, Baptists are sort of anti-tradition, but even then we have our own traditions, right? There are things that, um, that I could find in Scripture uh, that uh, would cause people to be very uncomfortable. I remember one time, the only time in recent memory where I have had somebody that I can remember stand up in the midst of a Bible study because of something I said and storm out, they were so mad. Okay? And literally, I said nothing other than, re I read a scripture verse out loud. What okay. verse? What? what verse? Exactly. Um, 1 Chronicles 26, 18. It's my life verse. 
four at the causeway, two at the par bar. That's all it says. No, no, no. Uh, it's, it's actually, my real life verse is 1 Samuel 15, 31, which says, and Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. No, but that's not, um, I have the precious moments figurine for that one. So, so, so um, no, it was, it was Colossians, Colossians 3, 15, I think it is, where it simply says this, let no one act as your judge regarding food or drink or any new moon festival. And I said, that verse means no Christian is allowed to put their arm around another Christian and go, you know, real Christians don't eat that. You know, real Christians don't drink that. You know, real Christians don't celebrate that festival. And a person was like, he came from the, I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't go with boys that do, right? And so, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, it's an uncomfortable thing, but the, I can say that Southern American Christianity has, uh, has strong roots in the, in the temperance movement of prohibition. And there are places where that tradition is stronger than Scripture. So I had a person who got offended when I said, you know, they were using their tradition to reinterpret Scripture. Um, I've, and so it's like, we do it. We don't know we do it sometimes because we think it's our interpretation or there are just verses we just discount or we don't factor in, or we find a way to... I've heard a lot of people do a lot of exegetical backflips trying to shoehorn their view of Scripture into, into something. They're, basically, what they're doing is they're taking their tradition and making it fit here. I don't want to get into a whole bunch of debates, but we could, we could, I could find them all, right? I, could, yeah, I pressed one, and some people are already uncomfortable. I, I talked about drinking, which you have to say with an A when you say it at a Baptist church. Um, I, I always found it funny when... Um, the soda machines here had Sprite Zero in it, and they changed the can in Sprite Zero. It used to be blue, and it, I could always tell tell what kind of uh, what kind of Baptist you were, um, because I, I'd come in with a Sprite Zero sometime from this vending machine, and some people would go, "Is that a beer can?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would bring one to church, and then and then other people would go, "Is that a Bud Light can?" <laughs> like they, they knew exactly which one it was. So um, like, gotcha. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I could pick another fight, right? Like I can find those places. Um, if you want to talk about it, let's let's talk about the first couple chapters of Genesis, right? A lot of people, a lot of people, think that they're reading Scripture for what it says, and they're actually taking their own tradition and interpreting it one specific way. Um, and it's like, which is for which? What are you? And you go, I'm getting uncomfortable, right? But that's what Paul's saying: don't go beyond what's written. And there's a chance that your interpretation of Scripture is not right. Same with mine. And our job is to surrender. I want the truth no matter what it is. Okay? I don't want to be right most of all. I want to know what is right. I want to, that's what it means to seek God and to seek truth. And I believe that the Bible is the holy, inspired, inerrant Word of God. I also believe that humans have a really wonderful way of twisting it to conform to what we want it to say. And so, my interpretation can be wrong, and how do I maybe need to modify my interpretation to fit what I know about Scripture and about history and about the world and about facts? We're going to talk about this a little bit when we come to some other things. That's a controversial and difficult thing. Any, any questions about that? And you notice how the moment you say something like this, are you a young earther or older? You want, one of the reasons I don't talk about a revelation, right? I can, easiest way to cause a fight, right? People start throwing rotten eggs and apples at me. And is because maybe it doesn't say what you think it says. Um, I think I'll be, I could do a history of the interpretation of revelation, and you'd be shocked to know that nobody outside of American Christians believed like American Christians about the book of Revelation. And nobody before about 1850 did. But it's now a part of our tradition. Um, so the, uh, I love study Bibles, but a lot of the, one of the sources of that is that. How many of you had like a, like a Ryrie or a Schofield Bible or whatever? Those are all helpful because they're always smart people. But um, a lot of, we, we assume sometimes the notes and the text are the same thing. You know, a buddy of mine had a joke, right? My hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and Scripture Press. Like, it's just... <laughs> that's an example of 
hold on tightly to Scripture and hold on loosely to people who interpret Scripture, including me. Right? Disagree with me. Please disagree. If I'm wrong, I have been wrong, you know, once. No, um, <laughs> we're all wrong because we all fall into this gap. My job, your job, our job is to be stewards of what we've been entrusted with. And that, and that thing sometimes can be difficult to understand and difficult to apply. But our goal is to have someone call us out when we're going beyond what's written. When we're focused more on our tradition and holding on to that more than on finding the truth, no matter where that lies. So, comments or thoughts? Um, man, I got, I got soup. So, uh, he goes on. He... Uh, he spends the, the middle part of this chapter, we'll go briefly, he says, he says um, kind of sarcastic, he goes, but you're already filled, verse 8, you're already filled, you've already become rich, you've become kings without us, and indeed I wish that you had become kings so that we might rule with you. For I think God has exhibited us, apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death. I wish I could find prosperity gospel preachers and make them read this passage. Because he shows what stewardship looks like and doesn't always look like worldly success. When you think worldly... When you think that your definition of trustworthiness and stewardship looks like worldly success, you're going to find yourself in problems. Not that God doesn't want to bless you, but sometimes the blessing doesn't look like what the world says. So Paul says, We're men condemned to death because we've become a spectacle to the world, both to men and to angels. We are fools for Christ, which means people don't respect us as intelligent or smart. But you are prudent in Christ. We are weak. People don't see us as, as, as competent, but you're strong. You are distinguished. You are celebrated, exalted, but we are without honor. There's going to be times when people think you're stupid, people think you're incompetent, people think you're disrespected. They're going to do it. Um, and guess what? That doesn't mean you're a failure. It might mean you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. This, um, I read this today. I found tremendous hope in this today because I look at I, I can show you the, the resume of, my, of what I would consider my failed academic career. You know, all of the ways in which I have, um, I could tell you my academic pedigree and how I went to have a PhD from one of the probably you know, top schools in the country for what I study and probably wrote my dissertation with probably one of the five greatest living English speaking people who studied this thing. And I couldn't get a job anywhere. And I, I, can, I, can, I can recount all the ways in which I had this checkbox of things that what I thought success looked like. And even when I came to the church, I would say things like, man, if I, was, if I was a pastor, I would have been a senior pastor by now, or I would have been a this by now, I would have been a this. And I was like, but I just, people think I'm incompetent. People think I'm stupid. People think I, I, I'm, just, I'm just nothing. I'm nobody. And you realize Paul's going, your job isn't to check the list and climb the ladder. Your job is to steward well the thing you've been given. And that's it. Um... And that's and every time you know every time there was you know temptation to go chase some other rabbit somewhere else, I always came back to my wife and I kept saying that Kingsden was the place that when I did what I felt like I wanted to do, which I would have done for free anyway, I was blessed in the process of blessing other people, you know. And that's what God, that's what Paul's saying is, look, I don't, I don't. Paul's not the professor of so and so. He's not the he's not the he doesn't have an estate. He doesn't have the position. He doesn't have the esteem. What he does have is the confidence that he's doing exactly what he's supposed to do because he is, he's experiencing the right kind of success. So, um, and so finally he ends uh, verse 14. He talks about his response. His present hour, verse 11, uh, we're hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed and roughly treated. We're homeless. We toil working with our own hands. We're reviled. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we slander, we try to conciliate. We have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. Because it's not his focus, right? It's not his focus to realize that maybe the things you want. I, I'm thinking about the, the TV show, um, the, the movie uh, Field of Dreams, when the guys built this field and got all these players, and he wants to go back and see what's in the cornfield. And they're like, what? He goes, I want to come with you. He's like, you're, you're not invited. But, but I, I did everything you said. I went and got these people. I, I, I built this field, and I never once asked, what's in it for me? He's like, well, he goes, what's in it for me? And because ultimately that's what we do. Like, okay, God, if I sacrifice a lot, if I if I really suffer a lot, if I really, I'm gonna win the lottery, right? It's gonna, there's gonna be a payoff. There's 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 gonna be a what's in it for me thing. And and Paul's like, it's like I did this all, and and I was okay, I'm okay with it because that's not my focus. That's the hardest things to do is to realize I'm not trying to get those things. 
this is not a tool to get all of those other things. Right now, think about that list you had when you were 18 or 20 about all the things you wanted the world to give you, about house and car and success and finances and trips, um, all of the lust of the world and lust of the eyes and the simple pride of life, all of those things you wanted to acquire. Jesus isn't a way to get that. God might have those things in store for you. Maybe he doesn't. What he does have and does, he does promise you, he does promise you joy. He does promise you purpose. He does promise you fulfillment. He does promise you life. But it might not look the way you think. The, the message of Scripture from the beginning to the end is your life is not going to turn out the way you thought. And that's a good thing. You know, I can, I can tell you where I was sitting when I read probably for the first time in my adult life, the verse that was the, the, verse that was the subject of the first sermon I ever preached at Kingsland. It's 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting your cares upon Him because He cares for you. Three aspects of God's love, that are God's, God's identity that are absolutely essential. Um, he is stronger than you. Humble yourself under his mighty hand. He's wiser than you. Like he has a right time that he may exalt you at the right time. He has a right time for your life, and it's a, it's a right time to give you good things. He's not, he's not pushing you down and, and pushing you aside. He has joy and purpose in life and fulfillment intended for you. But in the meantime, cast all of your anxieties upon him because he cares for you, because he's not just strong. He's not just wise. He loves you. Um, growing up in the military, I, I saw people who were stronger than me. I saw people who were smarter than me, and I saw them use that as a reason to marginalize and push people aside. Um, I remember where I was sitting in a church when I heard a preacher say, God is sovereign, which means he's stronger than you and he's wiser than you. Um, and that's a difficult pill, pill to swallow unless you also believe that God is good. And I realized that I sort of secretly thought that I didn't really trust in the love of God. Paul says, I can, I can handle being the dregs. I can handle being slandered. I can handle being reviled. I can handle being that because I trust God, that he's not going to waste my life, that he does promise me fulfillment, and that I can, be, I can be experience the blessing he has for me. So finally he says, I don't write these things, verse 14, to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. If you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would, have not, you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. He ends this by going, look, this is why I'm a, a great teacher, and so you should follow me. He goes, no, you shouldn't just follow me. You should be like me. This is what you should endeavor to be, fools for Christ, um, being willing to be ostracized by a world so that you can find the life that God has for you. He does it not to shame, not to browbeat, not to bully, not to humiliate, not to subject, but to show them the path that leads to life. So, what are you focused on? How do you see, do you, is your life full of good things, and do you see yourself as the creator and producer of all of those good things? Is your life full of suffering right now, and you don't know what you did to deserve it? Um, maybe, just maybe, we have to learn both to steward the good things that God has given us, to look for those ways in which God once gave to us to give through us so that we can be grateful to Him and useful to Him as He seeks to, to pour life into other people. But also, maybe, just maybe, um, what we thought our life was going to look like isn't what God has for us, but that doesn't mean God doesn't have life for us and blessing and fulfillment. It just might come in a different path than we were expecting. Let's pray. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to see our life as stewardship. Help us to see everything about who we are as gifts from you, down from the bodies we were born in, the places we were born in, the, the talents and skills and abilities we were born in. Help us to see them, not compare them to other people, how we, we are lacking the things that we wish we had. Help us just to see completely the good that you have poured into our lives and help us to learn to steward it well. Help us to see the blessing and help us to see how you're leading. Forgive us for all the ways in which we try to um, shoehorn our own understanding about what you're supposed to do into how we follow you. Help us to be willing to be fools for Christ. In the process, help us to find the life that comes from being close to him. 
I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So you have to go get kids. Go get kids. Or you need to leave. This is the question and answer time. Stump the guesser. Anybody have any questions for me? What's up? Uh huh. How do you make sure you're interpreting scripture correctly? Um, it's a good question. It's a constant process of learning. Always being willing to learn and be stretched. Um, you can find yourself, like it's that question, right? That person who stormed up out because I had found a part of scripture where he didn't like the interpretation of it and he would rather break fellowship than, than change, his, change his mind. Um, what's the, uh, somebody said one time, what's the definition of a fanatic? Is a person who won't change their mind and can't change the subject. Right? I, have to, I have to beat this point to no end. Um, and so learning, learning to hold on loosely, to want the truth more than you want to be right. And that's a sign of arrogance on our part. It's subtle, but when you want to be right more than you want to know truth. Um, and just be, it's a humility going, I don't have it, and I'm constantly learning. So, other questions? A comment, uh oh. Okay. Uh huh. So you've been talking a lot about our identity. And in fact, you know, Paul's point in a lot of the beginning chapters of, of First Corinthians is to talk about, you know, say who they are, who they think they are. And it's, it seems to me like the temptation is to try and define my identity from my own perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think Paul is saying that it's not defined by my perspective. Mm -hmm. That's what, in fact, is getting the Corinthians into trouble. It's defining your identity from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's, it's ultimately... All you ever have is your own subjective experience of reality, and, and it's problematic and wrong. That's why we need, we need other people too, right? The reason why we need a community of people to search for truth together is because um, if, if I'm wrong and you, all of us are wrong, if we're all seeing things from a different angle, we're able to triangulate where the truth is more accurately, and, they, and we can all come to, a, we have a greater likelihood of finding truth and specifically learning to see things from God's perspective when you have other people to hold ourselves accountable. The easiest way to be, um, easiest way to find yourself in error is to think that, to think that you are 100% convinced and won't let anybody change your mind. But yeah, part of Scripture is here's who, who you are before God. And the picture that God gives us is, I love this passage, and it's going to come out in the famous passage in 1 Corinthians 6, right? Um, for, in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, where it talks about love. The, God's love for us neither flinches at our sin uh, nor overlooks it either. It doesn't, like, uh, man is a glorious ruin, Francis Schaeffer said. We'll talk about this later. He's, you're, you are created in the image of God, and you can never forget that. But you're, we're also woefully broken by our own sin. And, if, and most bad ideas in our society have forgotten one aspect of that equation. If you think man is just glorious, you will have these wrong notions of, of how bankrupt our um, our souls really are and what evil we're actually capable of. And if you forget, forget that we're ruined, uh, if forget we're, create, we're glorious, created in the image of God, then you'll end up you know, hating people for no good reason. No, everybody, every single person you're looking at is a, a broken version of God's perfect idea of who they are. And God's trying to show you, here's how I made you to be, and here's how sin broke you. Now, will you please let me remake you? I hate your sin, and I hate your sin because I love you. And I'm trying to separate you from, from that. Yeah. But when we, when we, I still say, when we look at ourselves from our own perspective, mm -hmm. then it's not, it's always going to fall short mm -hmm. of, of God's true, per, true perspective. Yep. Because God is eternal and yep. we're not. And so God sees us not only today. Mm -hmm seen us from the day mm -hmm. before we were created in our mother's womb. Yep. And he sees who we will one day be changed mm -hmm. into. Yeah. Uh, and and we can't do that. And, yeah. and so I and so it's like shouldn't we be 
speaking are identical. Mm. God's perfect word is revealed in the Bible huh? as opposed to even yep. observations from other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, that's useful, but, but it's not... Yeah, I, tr I agree with that. Like you know, you know, it's funny. I almost, I almost, I almost chucked this whole study on First Corinthians four, and taught on Psalm one thirty nine tonight. I literally wanted to because um, I just felt I, I had. The, I, I think I was struggling a little bit with sort of that perspective. I needed. I saw my own faults and my own imperfections and my own failures all too clearly this last couple of weeks. And I was just tired and run down. I just needed to, I needed to be reminded of who God was and who I was in his perspective. I remember just going this afternoon, just reading through Psalm 139 and being reminded that God sees me, right? That he sees every aspect. He sees, he sees who, where I am. He sees what I'm doing in a good way. And he sees um, every day, every word that's on my mouth, every thought that I have, um, there's a line, Psalm 137, I think it's 139, 17, it says, how, new, how precious are your thoughts towards me, um, how numerous they are like the sand. Of the, 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 the number of thoughts God has about us, directed towards us, is the, that number of the sand on the seashore, that he, uh, he's intimately acquainted with every single dimension of our life, and he knows both beginning and end who, who he created us to be. Um, that passage, Jesus said, aren't two sparrows sold for a cent? And truly I say to you, uh, not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father. And you're worth much more than many sparrows. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're worth like seven sparrows. Like, that's what I, um, that, that you're exactly right. That trying to, one of the reasons you read scripture is to be reminded of not what the world tells you you are and not what you think of yourself and not what the enemy reminds you of, but this is who you are in God's eyes. This is who, this is who, who I know you to be. He knows your sin more than you know, and he has an unshockable love for you. And that love is saying, look, I, I, you're not going to hide anything from me. I love the last one. I'll let you go, I promise. But like that, the Psalm, one, the, Psalm 139 st starts and ends with the coolest thing. It starts off with, oh, Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You know the words. You know my thoughts. You know where I am. I can't go anywhere. Where can I go from your presence? If I rise, I, I can go, there's no place I can go where you're not there. What do you do with that kind of knowledge? It ends with. The only thing you can do, which is surrender to that truth. It starts with, oh, Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. It ends with, search me, Lord, and know my heart. Do what I already know you're doing. Please, let me see from your perspective. Show me who I am um, from your perspective and help me trust that um, what the world says and what I say about myself aren't true. So, well, cool. Boom. Break. Let's go. That's enough. Thank you. Yes. Yay. What? What? It's hurtful. Hurtful.